Good morning. I'm Patrick Muhlenschulter, Managing Director of the Washington Ballet. And welcome to our final episode of Bar Talk. Each month now, for the past eight months during this rather terrible pandemic, we've been proud to bring together Artistic Director Julie Kent and TWB Scholar in Residence Dr. Natalie Ruland and special guests to talk about the great art of ballet and the Washington Ballet's role in carrying forward this classical art form and shaping ballet today. Bar Talk is presented by members of the Balletomain Society. This morning, we're also joined by esteemed board directors, board of ambassadors members, corporate and foundation partners, members of the Ballet Corps, the Women's Committee and the Chate Society. For everyone joining, thank you very much for your support this past year. It's been difficult, but we got through it thanks to your support. Uh, this morning's discussion will be interactive. So if you want uh, a particular point explored further or you have a question, uh, just type in your comments or questions in the, uh, the chat function on the side of the YouTube video. That's if, particularly if you're watching on a laptop. Um, well, let's go over to talk to Natalie Ruland, our scholar in residence. Dr. Ruland is the Global Fellow for the Wilson Center here in Washington, DC. A scholar of R Russian literature, culture and performing arts, Natalie is completing her first book, Ballet Empire, the Russian M Era. Good morning, Natalie. Good morning, Patrick. How's the book going? Are you nearly finished? Yes, actually, I'm in final stage of revision, so everything is going very well. I'm very excited. Well, we're looking forward to reading it when it uh, publishes, and we'll have to have a fun get together now that we can. That will be very exciting. Natalie, who are we uh, uh, speaking with this morning? We'll be speaking with two of our upcoming choreographers, Silas Farley and Stanton Welch, and we'll also be speaking with one of our composers, Kyle Werner. It's very exciting. We're looking forward to the conversation. Wonderful. And um, well, I wish you all the best and look forward to watching the discussion. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Julie, the staff of the Washington Ballet and the generous support of the Balletomon Society for continuing to support this series over the entire year. Welcome to our May episode of Bar Talk. As we've mentioned during our previous episodes, Fridays have a special significance in the Washington Ballet history as co-founders Lisa Gardner and Mary Day hosted a series of intimate ballet evenings called Fridays at Nine during World War II. We've been so thrilled to share our wonderful behind the scenes conversations with you for this entire year on Fridays at 10. Last month, Julie and I hosted an inspiring conversation with Associate Director Victor Barbie on the enduring impact of Swan Lake on today's stage. Today, we'll be talking with Next Step choreographers Silas Farley and Stanton Welch and composer Dr. Kyle Warner on their upcoming works for the Washington Ballet. Julie, how are you this morning? Good morning, Natalie. I'm well. Very excited for the conversation today. Well, I'm so excited to see you, and I also wanted to congratulate you on the first in-person performance of the Washington mm -hmm. Ballet, uh, Tamash Krija's Ballet and Doves Unbound at the National Cathedral. So, Julie, how does it feel to take this first step uh, to going back in person at such a historic site? In the past, the Washington Ballet has actually performed original works at the National Cathedral during the mid-century as well. Well, th the experience was deeply meaningful on so many levels. Um, personally, as a child that grew up in this community, the Washington National Cathedral has always represented a very, very special place that my family would go on on special occasions um, to worship and to uh, celebrate special times of the year. Um, since I moved back to Washington, it's also my neighborhood, uh, my children's neighborhood, and very much the heart of the community um, here that is the Washington Ballet, the National Cathedral, and, and very much uh, affects the entire environs. Um, the, the sort of the inspiration that the cathedral provides is was the perfect backdrop for this first step into our sharing our art form with an audience, which without that exchange 
is a very different experience uh, as we all know watching watching on a screen um and then to add to that the collaborative um the commission from the cathedral the the brand new score by uh, blake neely and once again this the growth in the um, partnership between Tamash Krisha's choreography and Blake's music and 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 then add the, the incredible sculpture of the doves. I mean, it was just a, a really emblematic um, experience of all the beauty of all the connective tissues that art and um, the, the sort of uh, inspiration that the cathedral and the community has together. So it was really exciting. Well, we're also excited um, for, of course, in-person return this fall, we hope. And um, But until then, we will be having some more digital programming this summer um, on Marquee TV, June 18, our next step premiere with our choreographer, Dana Genschaft, with whom we spoke earlier this March. Now, Dana's piece, Orpheus, was just recently finished filming. Julie, could you tell us a little bit about how the piece finished up? Sure, it was, uh, it was again, a fascinating process. Uh, this time, because the pandemic restrictions had have advanced, we were able to film indoors. And so the lighting uh, effects were able to be created um, as opposed to our outdoor locations in the fall that we uh, had to use. So it added this, um, and of course the the topic, Orpheus and uh, his journey to the underworld and search for his Eurydice. Um, it, it was a very mystical, magical, fluid, um experience and i'm very very excited to see how again with this um uh the editing and the film capture and how what a very very different process it is to create um a, a dance in this in this way as opposed to our live performance exchange so uh really looking forward to seeing how the um the piece comes together but it was very fascinating to watch and very different than our, our fall performances, our fall captures. I think the indoor uh, nature was made a very big impact. It's thrilling to see the contrast as well between Dana's piece and what I've have been able to get a glimpse of with Silas's piece. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be talking today um, with Silas and our, our three special guests. We're very lucky to have three guests today. Um, Silas Farley is a dancer, educator and choreographer who currently serves as the Dean of the Treadle Zipper Dance Institute of the Colburn School in Los Angeles. Silas began training with the Charlotte Ballet and studied at the School of American Ballet before joining New York City Ballet, where he performed until 2020. Silas has created new works for such venerable institutions as the School of American Ballet, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the Guggenheim, and Silas was also an inaugural fellow in the Jerome Robbins Dance Division of the New York Public Library. Silas's collaborator, Dr. Kyle Werner, is a composer who's collaborated extensively with ensembles such as the Chicago Chamber Musicians and Eighth Blackbird, and whose works have been performed widely at venues including the Colburn School, the Guggenheim, and the Universities of Cincinnati and Michigan. Kyle studied at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music and the American Conservatory in France, in addition to receiving his doctoral degree of musical arts from the Manhattan School of Music. Kyle is a faculty member at the Manhattan School of Music Pre-College, the Geneva Conservatory, and the School of Mahanaim, as well as serving as music director of Christ Church Anglican in New York City. Our third choreographer, our third guest and choreographer today, Stanton Welch, is a world-renowned choreographer and the artistic director of the Houston Ballet. The son of two of Australia's leading dancers of the 1960s, Stanton trained at the San Francisco Ballet School and performed as a leading soloist with the Australian Ballet. Stanton has created original works for companies including Houston Ballet, San Francisco Ballet, American Ballet Theatre, the Australian Ballet, and Royal Danish Ballet. And for his contributions to the world of dance, Stanton was awarded the Order of Australia in 2015. So we have quite a collection of guests. Um, welcome to all of you. How are you this morning? Good, thank you, Natalie. Good, thank you. Very good, pleasure to be here. 
it's a, such a pleasure to have all of you. So um, Silas and Kyle, where are you broadcasting from today? I am at the Washington Ballet Building in Victor Barbie's office. <laughs> and I'm down the street at the Glover Park Hotel. I just got here yesterday and have been enjoying attending rehearsals uh, with the Washington Ballet. Wonderful. And Stanton, what about you? I'm down in Houston, Texas. Yeah. So we have quite quite a, a collection. Um, now, Silas, um, you made headlines last year when you retired at the age of 26 from your position as a dancer with New York City Ballet. What inspired you to make that leap to choreographer? I felt from the very start of my journey in dance that I wanted to be involved in the art form in as many different ways as possible. I knew I wanted to dance, I wanted to teach, I wanted to choreograph and write and study and lead in all those different, different roles. And I felt that I had fulfilled what I wanted to do in the dancing part of my journey. And I wanted to be able to pour myself more and more into the teaching, into the choreography, into the scholarly work, and to have the opportunity to really apprentice myself to great artistic leaders. I'd love to be the artistic director of a ballet company someday, and there's not really a formalized training mechanism in our art form for that. So I, I wanted to really just have a season of where I could apprentice myself to great leaders and learn and grow and to use the, the years that I still have where I can dance at my full capacity, because I'm still quite young, to use that to really illustrate, to use my dancing more as illustration than performance, to show what I would hope the movement to look like, teaching and in the similar situation doing the choreography. And it's been such a joy and I'm so glad to have made the transition and loving it. When you talk about um, dancing as, as illustration, um, you've also mentioned the idea of ballet as a language. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that. So what do you think the art of ballet as a language has to say for contemporary audiences today in general? Mm -hmm. And then in particular, what does your ballet, your new ballet, the Warner Sonata for the Washington Ballet, what, what are you saying or how are you trying to speak with that ballet? Yeah, it's, it's such a powerful language, classical ballet. It's, it has an immediacy because it's the human body in space and time moving. And I love what the choreographer John Neumeyer talks about, which is that the dancer is the instrument and the audience possesses the same instrument. So it is like a violin playing for an audience of violins. So there's this in, inherent empathy between the mover and the viewer in classical ballet that's very visceral and it's in a realm beyond words. It cuts across all kinds of cultures because it's based in the body and it's inherently human and it's becoming more and more and more precious because we've been in this strange disembodied time where we've all been reduced to our you know, clavicle bones up. And so to now be in be able to come back to performance and come back together, there's a there's a preciousness about the embodied nature of the of the dance work. And then the the language of classical ballet, I think it also has a power in that it communicates the beauty that comes from a sacrificial pursuit of something greater than yourself. Because there's a level of mastery required to do classical ballet. And the viewer knows if the person is on balance. The viewer knows if that's turned out or it's not turned out. And the, the rules actually provide this lofty aspiration and this kind of clarity. And it's an Olympian kind of a thing. And I think that that, that clear expectation and the, the clarity of the vocabulary of movement is something so beautiful and so and accessible in a unique way because it is based in the body. And I think a, another thing that ballet communicates <clears throat> is just the beauty of collaboration and the beauty of a group of people who have gathered together to make something, who, who've gathered around a common vision to realize something that they couldn't do by themselves. So, um, you know, there's all kinds of intrigue that goes on in preparing a ballet, but you know, once the curtain goes up, it's like it doesn't matter who's got who's who's at odds with each other or this or that. Everyone puts all of that aside. And for the 25 minutes of whatever the ballet is, we have this glimpse of a kind of order and collaboration and selflessness and people deferring to one another 
to make something magic together that I think has such potency and beauty. And, and just because of the rigor of the training, that the costliness of that beauty is something that the audience, I think, can really appreciate. Because you look at that and you go, wow, you know, I, I'd give my whole life to dance like that. And it's like the people on stage did. They did give their whole lives to dance like that. And there's a, there's a power in that. So you've been training, um, of course, you've been in the studio now with the Washington Ballet Dancers. Yeah. How has that process been? Could you talk a bit about your choreographic process? Yeah, it's been magic. The dancers have been such a joy to work with. And I, everybody's so, so delighted to be back in the studio. And there's such a beautiful spirit in this company that's palpable the moment you walk in. And everyone has just been so committed and so engaged with the movement. And for me, the dancers were in, in, in cohorts because of COVID working in small groups. So before I had my first day of rehearsal, I got to work with a few of my dancers who were in these different pockets, these different cohorts. And we just developed a whole bunch of movement vocabulary to different sections of Kyle's score. So that by the time we came in into the first day of rehearsal, we were able to start assembling sections of the ballet pretty quickly because we had already built out some of the language of the piece. And I would say too, with what I said before about the classical ballet vocabulary is that that's the language that I'm using to build the ballets. And I, and I love to teach. And I think of choreography and teaching as really being one endeavor and building ballets out of that classical vocabulary that these dancers have spent their whole lives cultivating. So there's already, and there's such a deep understanding of the language that I'm using so that they're not, they don't have to translate and then start their process of expressive interpretation. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just to say that using that grammar of the logic of how the classical vocabulary fits together, the dancer has a kind of immediate understanding and they've already started imbuing all of that language with their own flavor right from the start. So it's been really, we've been able to move really, really quickly through the, the creation of the piece. And the dancers have been just phenomenal. And we're so excited that some of the restrictions just lifted so I can put all 14 dancers together in the room today, which is really exciting and braid the sections. So a little more about the process. This first part of the week, they had in two groups of seven. And so, you know, one group had this section of the architecture of the piece and another group had that section of the architecture. But today we actually get to, you know, put the lines of the orchestration together and see what happens. So it's very exciting. And I think you have some videos from the studio that you can share with us. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to show you two clips. One is a section at the very beginning of the third movement. Kyle, I'm sure, will tell us more about the structure of the music. But the third movement is a finale, and it's written in rondo form. So if it was poetry, it's like A, B, A, A C, A, D, A, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the first statement of the A theme, and it's danced by Alex Kramer and Nicholas Cowden. And this will also be part of the Washington Ballet's gala in uh, in June, this, this last section. So uh, this is Alex and Nick. So let's see, it looks like it may be frozen. Um, we're trying to see if Silas's computer can play it right now. <laughs> yes. I think we're frozen, everybody. Maybe we could try the second clip. Okay, thank you. That was that was a later statement of the same A theme. And this connects to the conversation we we're just having about classwork, because 
I mean, all, every step has already been used in ballet, which is kind of the freeing thing about it. It's just a matter of putting them together in different ways and to, and to just delight in the connectivity with the classwork. So that phrase that starts at the wheel and they go forward into that turning step and the cabriole step, those two steps, the, the ambote step and the du tour en l'air and then the cabriole step are from my teacher, Andre Kremarevsky's class. And he was a principal dancer in the Bolshoi and then taught at the School of American Ballet for many decades. And those are some of my favorite combinations from his class. So we transfigured them into choreography. That's so wonderful. Now, Silas, you'll be filming at Wolf Trap, is that correct? Yeah, we're going to be filming in the Meadow Pavilion at Wolf Trap, which is a beautiful space. There you see it. And it has these, you know, beautiful wooden panels and it's open. And it's an interesting opportunity because it's a kind of bridge back to live performance. So they were really leaning into the, the like dance film aspect of what was possible. But Dana's piece and some of the more recent pieces, which have been so wonderful. And then this ballet is kind of a bridge back to live performance. So we'll set, set up a dance floor in front of the pavilion and it will be filmed more like a capture of a, a proscenium performance. There'll be a little bit of, you know, uh, sprinkling in of more um, in in zoomed in kind of camera work, but it'll be kind of a getting our eye re reconfigured towards the proscenium, and then we'll extract the third section of it for the gala. But it'll be very much in dialogue with the the space out there, and the costuming will pop against the wooden background. So yes, could you tell us a bit about the costuming as well? Yes, my wife, Cassia Farley, who's my muse and collaborator in every way, she designed these costumes. And Monica Leland, the head of costumes here at the Washington Ballet, built the costumes. And they're stunning. They're very simple, kind of filmy-like uh, material for the skirt that uh, six of the women wear. And then each woman has that top with a kind of crinkled pattern on it that's unique to each woman, but it looks almost like coral. And we thought it'd be fun to do a two-piece, Cassia thought it would be really fun to do a kind of two-piece costume that maybe wouldn't be as practical if there was a lot of partnering. But what our idea was going into it was that most of the dancers wouldn't be able to partner. So we thought, why not take advantage of that and make a costume that maybe the ladies wouldn't get to wear otherwise. And then the men are in a very simple light gray unitard. And I know from the dancers that at least one of them is her favorite costume she's ever worn. And I was laughing because I had, I had, I, there's a step that the court, that the whole, the whole group does at one point, and they do a kind of elaborate port de bras, kind of like Raymonda or Nikia and Leviader. And then I saw the costume, and then one of them was like this, and it was a total, total Leviader moment. So we've been having lots of fun talking about the the ballets of the past that these different steps evoke in our minds, even if it's just like a Sison Batu that makes us all think of Maria Tallchief and the Firebird, or Step Up Turn with shimmering arms going back like Suzanne Farrell and Brahm Schoenberg Quartet, just like little, little, little sprinkles here and there. So we've been having a lot of fun, a little nerding out during the rehearsals on the ballet industry. Well, it's wonderful to have all those sort of balletic citations, you know, the quotations you recognize from other works. And of course, you've also been collaborating with your good friend, Kyle Werner. Could you tell us a little bit about the process of working with Kyle on your ballet? Absolutely. It's the overflow of a long and beautiful friendship. We're like spiritual and artistic brothers. We first met back in 2015. And I remember we went to a brunch the first day that we met and we talked for hours and brunch became dinner, basically. And we realized that we had such a similar sense of calling to make new ballets in the classical tradition and to write new music in the classical tradition. And so that's been the really the foundation of years of conversation and 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 Kyle with such a similar vocation as someone who's a teacher maker and he's exploring that in his musical world and I'm exploring that in the ballet world so we're always and I was in, working in a university this past year at Southern Methodist University so we were commiserating about grading and panopto and, and canvas and 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 all of the, the just the fun stuff about uh, networking pedagogy with creativity and his music that he's written is sublime it's a sonata for violin and piano and I got to be there when it premiered he wrote it for a, a, a mutual friend of ours who was uh, uh, getting her doctorate in violin at Rutgers. 
and I went with Kyle to hear the performance. I remember looking at him after this was 2015, I think, 20 or not that long, but a couple years back. And I said, this is a ballet. And here we are all these years later and we're finally doing it as a ballet, but it's been, it's been such a pleasure. So we speak, we speak each other's languages. So it's been pretty, pretty effortless so far. So Kyle, from your perspective, could you tell us a little bit about your influences, your inspiration when you were working on this sonata? Yeah, absolutely. So as Silas said, we uh, figured out very quickly in our conversation, which actually it was even, it was in 2014, because it was right after I'd finished my study at Manhattan School of Music. And it was amazing to then um, to find someone who had this shared vision, because again, I in my own art form of classical music, I love the classical repertory. I love making new works that have a continuity with it uh, and a connection to it, um, but then are also bringing, hoping to bring something new and fresh as well. Um, and at the time that Silas and I had started talking, it was also a time I was heading in a new direction artistically. You know, in school, I was trying a lot of different things. I was kind of experimenting. And then after school, I really felt like I wanted to dig into these classical forms, this classical language. And so I started writing a whole series of pieces like this that use a lot of standard classical forms, that use a pretty direct melodic and harmonic language, um, and that also have a kind of rhythmic profile that I hoped would be, um, as Balanchine said, appetizing for dancing. Something that would work, you know, as a sonata, as a trio, whatever the piece is, totally should work in a concert performance, but would also work if it was going to be used in the future as a ballet. So most of these works actually were not they were originally premiered in concert and then some have been used for ballets later. But um, as Silas said, this particular piece I was writing for my violinist friend, uh, Julie Castor Lawrence and uh, our pianist friend, Sohyun An. So they premiered it, played it several times um, in New York and also out at Rutgers. And then a few years went by and then Silas had this idea for this piece um, and said that he wanted to use it. Um, and so it's fun because even though I wrote the music back in uh, 2016, it still has been a collaboration just because we always love to talk things through and uh, think through, yeah, what does the music look like in terms of movement? And I believe you have a recording you can share with us uh, as performed by the Washington Ballet pianist, Glenn Sales. Yes, so this is Glenn Sales and also uh, Regino Madrid uh, who recorded this. So again, with our, our, because we're filming it outdoors, it made most sense to get a good clean studio recording. Um, so Glenn and Regino did that together. And um, I guess I'll play you a little bit of the first movement. We heard some of the third movement uh, before in Silas's video. So what I'm gonna try to do here is to actually show you the score while we listen. So you can see a little bit of uh, what the music looks like on paper that is. <laughs> That's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, I know you said this was originally written for a concert, but you can hear this movement inherent, I think, in your sonata. Um, if you were to write in the future a specially commissioned ballet, what would you take into account in creating a ballet score? Yeah, absolutely. That's been one of the biggest questions that I've been thinking through in writing these different pieces. Um, and so what I found is, again, this is part of a series of different, uh, mostly chamber pieces that I've written several of which Silas has started to use for some of these uh, kind of projects. And then uh, this past year, we also did get to do one that ended up being, I was writing a new score specifically for our new ballet. Uh, I was writing a serenade for strings, actually very much in the tradition of Tchaikovsky um, and of course Tchaikovsky Balanchine serenade. Um, so what I think about, um, I think about dance, I think about uh, you know that it's the beauty of the human form 
it's about movement, it's about communication and interaction. And so that's kind of my starting point, I think, in terms of music, I think what that means is uh, kind of two main things. I would say lines and pulses. So in the sense that in music at the local level, the line means melody. Um, so when we, even in an instrumental piece, when we have melody, uh, we hear that connection with the human voice. And I think that that's why we relate to melody so well. And then the violinist can create this beautiful singing tone, you know, so it's sort of a, um, a melody even without words. Um, so that melodic line, I think, especially in classical ballet, that gives the choreographer something to latch on to. Um, and then the line at the larger level, um, there's a great composition teacher in the 20th century, Nadia Boulanger, who talked about the idea of the grand line. And that kind of meant the idea that a piece of music should have a, a clear form that you're kind of following all the way through, that it's not static, it's not fragmentary, but it has a strong narrative, even when it's not music that's actually telling a particular story, uh, that it's something you can follow. Um, and then the pulses, meaning that uh, music that has some sort of a rhythmic pulse uh, that the dancers can really hear and respond to. Um, first, at the practical level, it gives them a way to count and figure out how to coordinate the movements. Um, but I also think, you know, pulses, again, that's connected with the human body. It's connected with different emotional states, right? So a slow pulse, it can feel relaxed and peaceful, or it can feel kind of heavy and labored um, as it does, for instance, in the lament, which is the second movement of our piece. Um, and then a faster pulse can feel exciting and joyful. It could feel stressed or anxious. You know, it can communicate all these different things emotionally. And then you can also have pulses that are either regular or irregular. Um, and that creates an, another level of variety. So those are kind of the general things that, again, I also think that those are what make for a lot of interesting music in the concert hall. So I've tried to sort of just write what I thought would work in that way, um, and then that with the hope that then it would give, it would sort of plant the seeds for future choreography. I have a final question for Kyle and Silas, which is um, considering, you know, one of the greatest collaborations between choreographer and composer, we have New York City Ballet co-founder George Balanchine and Igor Stravinsky. So they were, of course, not only great colleagues, but great friends. Um, Silas, I know you've actually recently been commissioned to choreograph a new ballet for New York City Ballet in 2022, which is actually about this dialogue, as I understand. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about the relationship between Stravinsky and Balanchine and how it impacted 20th century ballet and 20th century music? I, I love the quote from Charles M. Joseph's book about Stravinsky and Balanchine, where he says, it's a paraphrase, but he said that they both embrace classicism with a sense of renewal. And I think that that phrase really encapsulates what they were about. They were looking, it, and another, another comment about Balanchine talked about, like he reached into the past and into the future at the same time. And you hear that in Stravinsky's music as well. He was reaching back into like, early Russian folkloric music, and he was reaching back to the music of the Renaissance, and he was reaching forward into dodecaphonic music. And so there was this incredible reach, but united through this disciplined classical training for both of them. And uh, they had such a, such a knowledge and an appreciation for the other person's um, craft. Balanchine on a whole nother level from most choreographers and so far as he could make the piano reductions of the scores and chose to be a choreographer and not a composer because he was so fascinated by the point shoe. So Balanchine's kind of on a whole nother level in that regard, but he really was, a, a the, the conductor Robert Irving said that Balanchine was like one of the musicians. So it's like you felt like you had another one of the musicians at the front of the stage, which is just an incredible legacy there. And then Stravinsky had this incredible love for the ballet. And um, Kyle, I would want, I would want to hear anything you would want to say about that relationship too. Yeah, yeah, picking up on that, that sense of uh, kind of time travel that you get in their works, the way that both Stravinsky and Balanchine can really reference all these different styles, all these different time periods in a way that's assimilated together very uh, organically just through their own personal taste and artistic vision. Um, I know from the composer side, you know, Stravinsky um, especially in his neoclassical period, was often really trashed by his modernist colleagues because they thought music has to move forward. That's what you have to do. But Stravinsky, there was always that freedom that you get to look backward and forward. Anything is possible. You just you bring your artistic vision to it and you 
you bring these different details together. Um, and again, in my limited knowledge of dance, I see Balanchine doing the same thing. And, um, and that's what I love too, is seeing the way that different, even Stravinsky's pieces from his vastly different stylistic periods, those generate different things in Balanchine's choreography responding to it. It always just feels like, even when it's a piece that was written before, it feels like the choreography and the music grew up together. It's just so closely knit. And, and Natalie, I would say one other thing too is that the openness on both of their part to absorb all kinds of new information and styles and Balanchine's fascination with jazz and all of the different kind of Africanist inflected dance forms and working with Catherine Dunham and working with Josephine Baker and Buddy Bradley and you see the Lindy Hop and the Four Temperaments and there was this openness about incorporating vernacular dance forms from all over and different kind of music and, and seeing that ballet and these musical forms had the capacity to not, it, to incorporate all of these different um, languages almost into a way that was gonna take the, uh, those art, enrich those art forms more and more and more. I think that accounts for so much of their, so much of their magic, Balanchine and Stravinsky. And also, um, I think we can also see this not just with Stravinsky and Balanchine, but of course with Stravinsky's early works. Um, in particular, one of his most influential works, The Rite of Spring, which was choreographed, which was composed in 1913 for the Ballet Russe production by uh, Sergei Diaghilev. Václav Nijinsky's choreography was shocking. It wasn't recognized as ballet on the stage at the time. Um, could we talk a little bit about, um, we have our, our wonderful third guest with us, Stanton Welch, who also created his own version of this groundbreaking work, um, Nijinsky's Rite of Spring. So Stanton, your, your ballet premiered in 2013 for Houston Ballet. Could you tell us about your experience re-envisioning this revolutionary ballet? <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, it, it is a long time ago for me, um, but Stravinsky is certainly uh, such a complex composer. I, I described it with the dances. It was like an onion that every time you felt like you knew a layer of the music and you started choreographing, you would hear a whole new, whole new layer. And uh, I loved digging into that. And when you worked with a, a company for a while, they know your musicality or you get to collect a group of people that hear that. And that was a really fun part of exploring this musically was how deep could we go in our musicality? What kind of nuance can we find in every note and every theme and every melody? What does it mean? Um, and then just like Silas was saying that it's, I love the, the ability of ballet and dance to collect from all cultures and from all time and from all things. And even architecture and food and plant life, dance has the ability to pull into itself all of those things. So for me, it was, it was about, uh, you know, a fantasy environment of a very, uh, two tribes coming together and having a wedding ceremony. So the first section was the, the female family preparing and the second section was the male family preparing and the rite of spring was the two tribes coming together and having them marry. So that was my interpretation and it was a full company piece. Um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a lot of fun to do. It was something I'd wanted to do since I saw a Fantasia as a child, I think. And you have, Stanton, you have a ballet russe background sort of built into your bones, so to speak. Your parents, Garth Welch and, and Marilyn Jones, uh, who were founding principals of the Australian ballet, were also members of the Borovansky Ballet, whose founder, like our co-founder, Lisa Gardner, previously performed with Anna Pavlova's company. So you have that kind of ballet russe heritage in and your Houston own. Ballet. And Houston Ballet. So and Houston Ballet. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, ballet roots were kind of like the seed throwers of all dance through, you know, the new countries, Australia, Canada, America. Um, and as they toured and, and about people experienced classical ballet for the first time, people got married and stayed behind and opened ballet schools and companies. And that certainly seems to all through Australia was the course of action. And that's how all these great little schools popped up, which became companies. Um, it was so instrumental in creating dance in Australia and America. Can you tell us a little bit about growing up in a family of dancers? 
<laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, so certainly for I, 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 my mum uh, was a dancer and also artistic director. So we were always at the ballet and uh, dance for me since childhood was something that was always around and something that I was aware of. Um, so we were exposed to classical music a lot, which I didn't realise until I got older how wonderful that was and that all children need to hear classical music right from birth. And that just inspired me in all music. And, uh, and ballet is that thing that you always bring yourself. And so what you see is a reflection of yourself and your own feelings and your own mood and your own time. And I love that about it, like a painting. You, you, it's not telling you necessarily what to think or feel. It's sort of suggesting it and you like a mirror, see things back in yourself. And I, I just found that a fascinating thing. And I, I started to be an actor to avoid dancing because I didn't want to do what my parents did until I was 16. Um, but then I kind of discovered that ballet was sort of the ultimate acting because, again, you don't need language. You can say so much with some simple gestures and where you grew up and, and what ballet companies were your uh, idols create all this sense of movement so like i too share the by dare shape it's in nearly all of my ballets um i love putting that kind of classicism motifs or signatures of things into classical work and everything that silas said at the beginning as an old fat man sitting here i thought thank god someone in their 20s is saying this about ballet yay ballet ballet has a future <laughs> Um, because it, it is to me, you know, like Shakespearean acting and storytelling, sort of the, the groundwork of, of greatness. And I think to really be a great contemporary choreographer, you also need to understand the classic and classical ballet gives you that reach back and forward and all around the world and to every culture, every color, every animal. Um, it's such a, a great art form. And so as artistic director of the Houston Ballet, how do you balance these two roles, restaging the classical repertoire, Sleeping Beauty, La Bayadere, and then also creating your own original works that you often are commissioned to create for different companies? How do you balance the two roles? I'm not sure. I guess I'm still in the discovery of balancing a lot of things. And uh, COVID certainly has changed all of that. Um, I kind of put ballets into different pockets. <clears throat> When you are recreating something like Bayadere, I, I put a lot of effort in research and tried to make it something that was very classically correct or at least correct in what I could find. And if there were two or three versions, I wanted to include those two or three versions in the work to show the progression of the work. And um, something like Rite of Spring is just pleasure for me. It's something that I've always wanted to make, always wanted to do. I love the music. Um, and, and so they, they, they're sort of different things you need as a, a, a company, as a director, to have ballets also that are made on specifically on certain dances. You need to make sure that you're covering a broad range. So as a director choreographer, I'm not always as free in my creative choices as I am, as I, as I can be when I travel, if that makes sense. So do you have any initial thoughts for your upcoming piece with the Washington Ballet or will you sort of wait until you get into the studio to find Everything Silas said, can we just go back and play the beginning? Um, I don't feel anywhere near that articulate. Uh, but yes, it's a purity of classical ballet and I felt like um, that, that the choice of the music again is something that I've loved since childhood. I'm very familiar with it. Uh, and I wanted to make something very clean and pure. And it, it reminds me of Clear, which is a ballet I made with Julie. We're in a similar time, I think, as people. That was straight after September 11th. And I think art form sometimes needs to just be calm and shape and music. And that connects to people and their soul, but it doesn't have the angst and the drama. I don't want to really see that just now. I want pure, clean classical lines and, and music that is captured in every tiny little detail and really bring out the, the person or the people that are in front of you. Julie, Silas, um, Silas um, was talking about working with you and now um, Stanton, the, your experience working on Clear as a dancer with him. Could you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> sure, I'll, I'll try not to get emotional about it, but um, as, as Stanton uh, said, the, the 
ballet, we first met, uh, well, on September 11th, the American Ballet Theater was on tour in Kansas City and um, with the rest of the world watched um, the tragic events unfold. And uh, we ended up taking a bus uh, across the country in order to continue our tour uh, in San Diego and then uh, Seattle. And that is where we met Stanton um, who was beginning his first commission for American Ballet Theater. And uh, I'll never forget the time, space, the studio, and the first gesture, which was wiping, <laughs> wiping the tears away. And I thought, I mean, I just, it's, it's what art can do to heal. And um, here we are, 20 years later. <laughs> Is it really 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> and um, in a place where that is needed again, right? Yeah. That kind of healing and sense of Presence. the divine, right? So, yeah, I, I told you I couldn't get emotional. <laughs> I couldn't not get emotional talking about it because it's that deep, it's that profound. And I guess that is the illustration of, of the potential and, and what our art form does, right? It, it's beyond the words. So, yeah. So, so mentioning this pivotal moment that we're at again, 9-11 and now here with the pandemic, what are the lessons learned that you think we will carry with us as, as the Washington Ballet moves forward and as the art of ballet in general moves forward? Stay well, flexible. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think what we've heard today from from Silas and from Stanton and from Kyle is just is the is the foundation for where where what our art form actually the potential that we have. It goes back, it goes forward, it goes in, it goes out. And this whole experience that we have all lived together. Um, has been a huge time of learning about ourselves, about each other, and about all that we care about. And everyone on this call um, has, has dedicated their life to this art form and to music. And so it is that all the learning that we've all experienced and the time that we've had to spend really investigating and searching everything um, that is going to impact the future in, in I'm sure, a very positive way. Um, but it all has also, uh, this time, has magnified the fragility of life and of this art form. And so it's with very tender and secure hands that we need to both, <laughs> we need to guide it forward um, as, as life, right? As, as a fragility of just the human existence, um, the human experience and, and what, what we can do. So, so we'll be seeing Silas and Kyle's piece on June 18 on Marquee TV. Stanton's upcoming in the summer as well. So we're very much looking forward to that. Julie, when will the Washington Ballet be revealing works for the upcoming season? We hope to have an announcement prepared for uh, our gala, which is June 4th at the Kennedy Center. We're, and we uh, are very, very excited about uh, our return to live performances and sharing with our community, um, our incredible artists and our beautiful art form and also teaching our students um, in the studio again and, uh, and sharing all that we've learned and all that we aspire for, so it's exciting. Well, as we look forward to future seasons of the Washington Ballet and future generations of the Washington Ballet dancers, I would like to close our final episode of the season with an image from Julie Kent's Defile, which was performed in our final season before closing, um, and the words of Anna Pavlova, the great Russian ballerina and mentor of Washington Ballet co-founder Lisa Gardner, 
Pavlova wrote in 1926, dancing is pure romance and is by the grace of romance that man sees himself as he should like to be beautiful, free, healthy, and happy. So let's take this moment now to have some questions from our subscribers. If you've been able to drop your questions in the chat box. Let's see if we have any. There's an enthusiastic question from a canine friend. Um, let me, I, I can ask actually some additional questions um, to Silas and Kyle. Um, so you, we worked together previously as well for one of your uh, Guggenheim works in process, is that correct? So could you tell us about that process? Absolutely, the works in process did a great program called virtual commissions during the pandemic. So making different kinds of art films. Some people had music, some people did choreography. And my wife and I were living with her parents in McKinney, just outside Dallas, Texas last summer during that time. And Kyle had written this wonderful cycle for guitar called Kiklades based off of these islands that he'd been through on a sailing trip in Greece. And so we used the first movement from that guitar cycle and I did a trio for me and my wife and her sister, Eliza, who is also a beautiful dancer. And we did a, a series of short variations and then a little trio at the end. And uh, the golf course behind my in-laws home was a wonderful outdoor studio and um, performance space. So being, back at, being out at Wolf Trap on the Meadow yesterday made me think back to our COVID era pasture ballets. But um, that was it was a wonderful collaboration. And Kyle, I'd love whatever you'd like to say about it. Too. Yeah, well, it's amazing to think that music I wrote, I think, like 10 years ago. So that was, yeah, that was a piece I'd written uh, for my guitarist friend, Jordan Dodson, who's just an extraordinary classical guitarist. Um, and so it was a piece that has seven movements. It's kind of a longer cycle of different short pieces, as Silas said, based on these different islands, different inspirations out there. And um, yeah, so this I wrote several years before I'd even met Silas. This was a piece where I really wasn't thinking about dance at all. I was just thinking about uh, writing a piece that um, really showed off all of different things that what the guitar could do and also was uh, kind of bringing together these different inspirations I had. Um, so it was an exciting thing to just have this piece come back out of the woodwork and be used for this pandemic era golf course ballet. I never could have expected that. That's so wonderful. Um, Stanton, I have a question for you, which is, um, you know, you've, you've worked so extensively in the worlds of both American and Australian ballet. Could you talk a bit about those two different worlds and how they're similar or different? Uh, sure. Well, American ballet, I think, is, is divided into a few uh, sections. There's, of course, the Balanchine um, ballet religion, and then there's the uh, European one. Um, and Australia follows a little bit more closely to that. So Houston Ballet and Australian Ballet have a very similar ballet heritage. It's Royal Ballet, uh, Royal Danish Ballet, uh, Macmillan, Cranko, Ronnie Hind, uh, all those actually probably similar to Julie's experience a little bit more with ABT. But um, so they are actually very similar. So Australia and Houston, Birmingham Ballet, National Ballet of Canada, all a very similar repertoire pathway and ABT and San Francisco sort of sit in their own unique one that's in between and then there's the Balanchine versions <laughs> uh, that's how I see the the different um, the different worlds so I often hear references to Balanchine rep that I've seen or know a little bit of but don't have the familiarity of the shape or or, or the, the sound where uh, you know I could rattle off Ashton's ballets from the beginning of time and Ben had them all in Houston Ballet and uh, you know Sarasota Ballet does that Ashton rep you see it in Joffrey. Joffrey Ballet is a lot of Ashton, a lot of Cranko. So in America I sort of divide it into three uh, groups and Australia hits that Royal Ballet emphasis, RAD. And Julie how do you feel about that with your background in American Ballet Theatre and now at the Washington Ballet where do you see the Washington Ballet fitting into that repertoire? Well we have it well at Stanton described it beautifully and and um, I think the, the wonderful part about the Washington Ballet is that we have you know access to all of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, uh, there are certain ballets uh, at ABT that, uh, Balanchine ballets that, that are, and Robin's ballets, they're off limits. Uh, so I never dance Serenade. I never dance most of the Robin's rep and so much of the Balanchine rep, whatever Balanchine jewels, ABT, uh, either Balanchine made for the company or that we had the ability to perform, then, uh, you know, I treasured. But there's such a concerto Barocco, like all oh. these ballets that I never, I, I only have from the audience perspective, I don't know them from the inside. And so bringing them to the repertoire of the Washington Ballet, um, along with all the other uh, new voices and different voices is something that I've enjoyed so much um, because I get to see, I get to see it coming uh, that that first experience for our dancers, and it's something that I I never share. I never lived, um, so it's a very very different feeling. But I I love it. Well, I'm very excited to see our new works coming up first at the gala, a preview of the gala, and then premiering uh, on Marquee TV on June 18th. And I wanted to thank Julie, Silas, Kyle, and Stanton for this fascinating conversation. It's been such a joy to be involved in Bar Talk for this season. Thank you so much to our Balletomon Society, our subscribers, and our donors for your continued commitment to the Washington Ballet. Thank you for joining us for this season's Bar Talk. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you.